Go. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me just put, got it. There we go. Hi, everybody. I am Lynn Leatherwood. I'm the president of Story Circle Network, and I am delighted to have our current Sartan and Gilda winners with us today for an interview uh, for all of us to learn from their hard-won experience of having these award-winning books. So welcome, everybody. And congratulations for your, this is a, has become quite a prestigious contest and win for you. Let me tell you, it is, it's very, very competitive at this point. And so if you're sitting here, then you have been working your rear end off for a long time. We know that for sure. And it has paid off because you have produced some wonderful, wonderful books. So Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having us. Thank you, you for having us. Welcome. Uh, now, what we're going to do is I'm going to we're, we're I'm going to have each one of you introduce yourselves and um, and, and your the name of your book, the name of your category, and obviously your own name. Um, and then let's then you will have we'll have a couple of minutes to do what we think of as an elevator pitch okay you're going to tell us about your book all right at the end so what let's do this first I want to go around just so everybody knows who's who and then I'll ask you specifically about your your book okay mm -hmm. so Margaret can 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 we start with you Hi, I'm Margaret Novacek. It's it's such a thrill to be here. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for the award. And I'm from Hamilton in Canada. Ooh, oh, okay. Very good. And can you tell us your category? Oh, and yes. Uh, memoir. 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 And the name of your book? <laughs> and Chasing Zebras. Oh, I, I have to, I'm sorry. I have to unblur it so you can see my Chasing Zebras. Oh, there zebra we go. Chasing with the zebra. sticker. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Margaret from Canada, Chasing Zebras, <laughs> memoir. All right. Go ahead, Sally. Can you tell us about you? Yes, I'm Sally Weisinger. Thank you so much. I'm still trying to get over having won this award. Um, my book is, yes, again, Misadventures of a Wishful Thinker. It's the Gilda Award. It's a memoir. And I think the definition of Gilda is makes you laugh when you want to cry. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and I live currently in Portland, Oregon, but for most of my life, I've lived in New Orleans and the Bay Area. Okay. All right. Well, so we're happy. Did you, uh, are you naturally funny? We'll just ask this one little question. Before With the help of my wonderful editor, Courtney, who is on this, uh, I am naturally funny, but there were things in this book that were not funny. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Valina. Hi, I'm Valina Beatty. Uh, I am the very appreciative award winner of the Sartan Nonfiction Award. Uh, I am in Bloomington, Indiana, and I just moved here from Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and I got the award for Manifesting Justice, Wrongly Convicted Women Reclaim Their Rights. So thank you again so much. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Thank you, Valina. Uh, Anastasia. Hi, I'm Anastasia Zadaik. I live in San Diego, California, and I won the um, Sartan Award for Contemporary Fiction for my novel, Blurred Fates. Can we get a little sticker? Yay! Um, <laughs> and i um, just so honored to be with all of you and for the award. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, you're most welcome. And Kim, Kim Brown. Yes, I'm Kimberly Garrett Brown, and I won for the Sardin Award for Historical Fiction for uh, Chorus Kitchen, and I am coming to you live from Boca Raton, Florida. Okay, all right, very good, very good. And hopefully everybody's weather is not as hot as it has been for, at least here in California, it's been very hot the last few few days. Uh, Canada, I hope you're, I hope things are better at Margaret for you up there. No. 30 degrees in the shade. Centigrade. 
Wow. So nice. about a hundred and, and thereabouts. Oh, okay. All right. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. Maybe ninety-five. I don't know. Well, whatever. It's, <laughs> it's yeah, pretty hard. This is what we know. Okay. Very good. All right. So let's go back through, and everybody will just take. Let's go the same uh, route we just took, and you can tell us just your elevator pitch for your book. Okay. So Margaret, why don't you go ahead? All right. So my book is titled Chasing Zebras, and it is a memoir of genetics, mental health, and writing. So people wonder what do chasing zebras, what do zebras have to do with medicine? And in first year medical school, we are always taught that um, when you are facing with a, faced with a patient, we are to think about common things. When you hear hoofbeats outside the window, think horses, not zebras. Don't think about the very, very rare rare conditions. If a patient has a cough, it's a pneumonia and not Wagner's granulomatosis. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. as a geneticist, as a pediatric geneticist, which is my life, I have been spending the last 25, 30 years just dealing with very rare and unusual conditions. Therefore, I've been chasing zebras. The book is not only about uh, my life as a geneticist, but also my life as a person who has had undiagnosed mental health issues. Um, and also the most important thing I think is about how writing has saved my sanity and my mental health. Very good. Well, you have just, there's so much there, Mark. <laughs> it's uh, Andy, I, I could spend, uh, I'm sure the entire time only talking to you just about your work, but much less yes. anything else. Yes. It sounds like a fascinating book. And um, just on full disclaimer, I am letting you know, I have not read your book. So I am, I am interviewing you from having not read them. So always keep that in mind. There'll be many people here who have not read your book. So don't take anything for granted. Just go ahead and tell us everything, okay? And that's just fine. Um, okay, thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, Sally. Okay. Um, my book is a memoir. Uh, it opens by talking about a very happy 25-year marriage that I had after I was divorced at age 29. And I did it through the personals, the old newspaper personals in San Francisco. Um, and I go back and forth between my background as a conservatively bred Southern girl from New Orleans, Louisiana, a military brat, then moving to going to Berkeley in the 60s and then staying in Berkeley. Um, when I was 57, I lost my husband and had the sad parts of my book. Um, but little by little, I was absolutely determined to make my life valuable again. And I did that through volunteer work in Central and South America, working with doctors who performed surgery on children with cleft palates and cleft lips, uh, working in the Dominican Republic, rescuing dogs walking service dogs for a quadriplegic, and really getting my life back together, um, but still missing something that wasn't just volunteer work and friends. So <laughs> in the early 2000s, uh, in my late 50s, and then 60s, and even 70s, early 70s, I started doing the online personals. And boy, was that a switch because I met man, men who had um, been convicted of fraud, been convicted of child abuse, uh, sexual child abuse, um, men that wanted me to lend them lend them $25,000, which I was never going to see again. And then I had funny episodes that were, for example, I met a man for coffee in Berkeley, and we spent the entire time talking about his hemorrhoid operation and <laughs> things that I just had to write about. I mean, I couldn't not write about it. So by then I was writing chapters and some things were funny and th some things were sad. Uh, I lost three more members of my immediate family. Um, and at the end of hearing about hemorrhoids and fraud and convictions and everything, with the help of my nephew who is and my sister, they are both on this uh, Zoom call, 
I came up with a strategy that I will not tell you about, but it's called pastrami and it worked. And I now live in Portland, Oregon, but I still have my home in, in Berkeley. And that's my pitch. But if we read your book, will we know what, about pastrami? Oh my God, will you know? You will know, and you will know a lot about music and about dogs and about being an uptown girl from New Orleans and about my peccadillos. Um, and I have to tell you, there's stuff in there that I could not have written if my parents were still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I think now we've got, we, we're going to all be buying that book <laughs> because I am very interested in this pastrami concept. <laughs> <laughs> that just alone. Okay, thank you, Sally. Thank you. Uh, Valina, what about you? Tell us about your book. Thanks. Um, so Manifesting Justice, Wrongly mm -hmm. Convicted Women Reclaim Their Rights, um, is the first book to look at how women and queer people are uh, more likely to be wrongly convicted where no crime occurred. So what does that even mean? I'll give you an example. Uh, Christine Bunch here <clears throat> in Indiana, uh, she's at home with her young son, and there's an electrical fire, uh, and she survives, but her son dies. Uh, this is not caused by any person, but the police and the prosecutors uh, believe that she intentionally set the fire and charge her and convict her of arson and murder, and it took almost two decades before her wrongful conviction was reversed. Uh, so my book talks about this and it focuses specifically on a story of uh, women, queer women who I represented uh, as an innocence litigator. Uh, and the root of the story is that there are three women and they meet in a drug rehab facility in rural Mississippi. Uh, and two of those women are Lee and Tammy, and they meet and they fall in love. Uh, and they successfully complete the program and are excited about the next stage of their life. Uh, and they're about to leave in their pickup truck, in Lee's pickup truck, uh, when this third woman they become friends with, Kim, asks if she can come along with them as well. And Kim hasn't been doing as well and really just wants to leave the uh, program, which is an abstinence only program. Uh, so they leave and uh, tragically within about 24 hours, Kim has overdosed. Oh. So uh, so Lee and Tammy get her to the hospital, call 911 uh, and Kim is in a coma. And there's a doctor there who thinks that maybe Kim was sexually assaulted. So who does he bring in? You'd think he would bring in the, like call the police, which he did, but hopefully surprisingly, uh, he asks a, a county dentist to come to the hospital. And so this county dentist comes and examines Kim's body uh, when she's unconscious, completely naked, can't give any consent. And he, uh, believes that he finds bite marks and in fact finds this is what he says uh, bite marks on Kim's vagina no there's never any other proof of this uh, never any blood uh, for example but these are his findings so who could have done such a you know wild crazy horrific act these two lesbians who Kim was most recently with uh, so that's what starts the wrongful conviction of Lee and Tammy, and they were incarcerated for 10 years oh. until I was part of reversing their conviction. So that's the story of the book. There's many other stories in there as well. Um, but if you want to know more about wrongful convictions of women and queer people and what we can do about it, mm -hmm. uh, then I hope you'll pick it up. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. What a tragic uh, story. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Uh, well, that is, um, I, I think that's only one of many tragic stories. Yes. And good for you that you were able to, uh, help overturn their wrongful conviction. That must be, uh, that's must be life-changing for you as well. Absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful.
Well, that sounds like a fascinating story. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Anastasia, tell us about yours. That's a tough one to follow, I have to say. Oh, um, I guess. <laughs> um, so Blurred Fates is a story about a woman whose seemingly perfect life unravels when um, her husband's confession of a sexual indiscretion triggers hers in ways that she didn't see coming. And it's an exploration of memory and family legacy and the power of facing the past. Um, I, in my first career, I, I worked in neuropsych research and I've always been fascinated by the nature and nurture debate um, and how it is that we become who we are, hence the title Blurred Fates. And um, yeah, so I wrote it as women's fiction, but my readers, um, many of my readers characterized it as a psychological or domestic thriller, which was an interesting development for me as a writer and something that we, if we have time to address that later in the mm -hmm. discussion, um, that might be something interesting to talk about how things can change um, as you write. So, but that's the basic, it's, it's, it's sort of a page turner. And I, I, I'm going to go off script here just a little with some of these questions uh, and, and did you anticipate that when you, when you started writing the book, did you think it would go that direction? I did not, but it, it's interesting because I think that one of the steps in my editing process was that I'm, my background as a writer was from writing short pieces, um, sort of short story, five to eight page long stories mm -hmm. where there's a very clear beginning, middle and end. And when I began writing my novel, I started writing the chapters as if they were little stories. So there was a beginning, middle and end. And I realized that one of the problems with doing that was it didn't give anyone incentive to turn the page because you felt a sense of resolution at the end of the chapters. And so I went back in and added elements of um, you know, un something unresolved or unsettled right. at the ends of chapters. And as a result, I think that that amped up the the kind of thriller-esque aspect of the right. book um, without me setting setting out to do that. I think that that's what ended up happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and that whole I, the whole idea of uh, these these memory, this faulty memory or memories and how it all works together. Uh, yeah, I think we can all relate to that. Yeah, I was in a, I was in memory research, and so um, for wow. me that is a super interesting topic. It's like how much of our lives are dictated by things that we misremember or don't remember or suppress, um, exactly. and and how that can can impact not just your life but the life of the people, the lives of the people uh, around many you. people around. Yeah. You. yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. And blurred fates. That's a really great title. Thank you. That title. Yeah. Good job. Um, Kim, how about yours? Yes, um, I my book is Cora's Kitchen Historical Fiction, and it is about, um, it's set in the 1920s in Harlem, uh, New York, during the Harlem Renaissance. And it's about a woman named Cora, obviously, um, who wants to be a writer, but as a Black woman in the 1920s, as you can imagine, um, not only does she have her sex against her, she has her race, and also economics, but she has, she works at the 135th Street, 135th Street Library, which if you know anything about um, Harlem in the 1920s, that's where sort of the um, Harlem Renaissance was born out of there. And so she has a correspondence relationships with Langston Hughes, the poet, who she knows from the library. And he sort of walks her through becoming a writer. And so in the book, there is um, sort of how she's balancing the life, her life in writing and trying to learn to write. So there's a mixture of, of short stories that she's working on, writing advice from Langston Hughes, um, as well as um, journal entries from her as she's dealing with her life. Um, and so it's very much sort of a, even though it's said in the 1920s, it's about a woman who's married, who has a job, who's got children. And all of that while she's trying to write. And I've heard from many writers uh, who've read the book that it is very timeless in the sense that it's something that we all sort of experience um, in yeah. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking that that could be a contemporary book as well. However, 
the fact that she has Langston Hughes <laughs> to talk yes, to. Yes, and yes, yes. She has that wonderful milieu of of a writers and artists, musicians from that time period uh, would be. I mean, I'm sure that's a very rich, that's a very rich background to be able to pull from for your Absolutely. book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That sounds fascinating. And I love Cora's kitchen. I'm assuming her kitchen plays a major role. In... <laughs> Absolutely. A, a kitchen, yes. <laughs> the, <Okay>. the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Now what we're going to do, and we're trying to do this so everybody gets a chance to talk. Uh, we communicated with everybody beforehand and asked them specific questions that they wanted to answer. Uh, I think most would love to answer every question, but in the in the uh, interest of time, we just want to make sure that everybody gets some time to talk about these wonderful books that they've written. So uh, the first question, and of course, I want to ask everybody this question. It's really hard for me to be controlled here. I, I'm trying to stay calm, but because I'm just desperate to ask lots of questions. But I'm gonna I'm gonna be good because Liz is here with me. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't. But anyway, uh, so now I'm gonna ask Margaret and Sally specifically what motivated you to write your books. Okay, so Margaret, let's start with you. And let's hear what motivated you. There were two reasons why I wanted to write about my life as a clinical geneticist. Two, maybe two and a half. So one and one and a half are to show people what clinical geneticists do. Because most of the people, when I say I'm a geneticist, they say, oh, you work in a lab. Uh, no. I am I am I'm a physician and I work with patients and I see patients all the time and I deal with pretty serious and life altering or sometimes life ending conditions and it's a very it it can be very difficult. I also do prenatal genetics um prenatal diagnosis which was and you can find out from my book it it almost it broke me actually it didn't almost break me it broke me. And um because of the issues that are inherent to prenatal diagnosis. But I felt that as a clinical geneticist outside of the group of geneticists who understand what we do, even pediatricians don't know what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, internists, no clue. And any other subspecialty, they really didn't have much idea of what geneticists do and how hard it is. So that was that was the reason. That was the reason why I wanted to write the book. The other, the, the, the half, the one and a half is I wanted to get a little bit of respect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I felt like geneticists get no respect. And it sort of felt like that, especially at the beginning of my career where, where genetics was in its infancy. Um, I started in, uh, in the mid nineties. I started my training in the mid nineties and started working a little bit after that. And there was very little that we could do even in terms of genetic testing. But since then, with the human genome pro, uh, um, uh, genome uh, discovery and publish, publication, we can do so much more. We can do so much more about diagnosis, predicting what the patient will life will be to a certain extent from the medical point of view. We can always talk about the recurrence chances, the chances of recurrence, the recurrence risk. So there's a lot more that we can do now that was at the very beginning. The other reason why I wrote, wanted to write this book was because, as I said earlier, writing saved my sanity. Um, and uh, I wanted to share that uh, with the reader. I wanted people to see how important, especially for somebody in a, in a high uh, stakes uh, occupation like myself, like a physician, uh, dealing with prenatal and dealing with life-ending conditions, how important writing was for me. Um, I wanted, I was addressing it mainly uh, to other physicians and medical students and other trainees in, in health sciences, but I have gotten wonderful, wonderful feedback from non-medical people as well that, that, that they really liked it and it was, it was an interesting book for them. So those are the two reasons, to get some respect, <laughs> <laughs> to explain what, what, what clinical genetics is all about and to show how important um, and life-saving writing can be about when you write about difficult issues. 
Yes, yes. Um, I can't even imagine what level of stress. <laughs> I can't even imagine how hard that would be to deal with that every mm. day. I yeah. mean, that must be, I can see, I mean, the prenatal alone would be enough, but if you're yeah. dealing with all of these different, uh, very, very difficult diseases yeah. um, and the people, you're not just dealing with the disease, you are dealing with- No, people. I'm dealing with people, yeah. You're I, dealing I, with I, the people, yeah. you are not in the lab. You are dealing yeah. with, you're looking at these people and that must be very, very, very difficult. Hats off to you for Thank you. assuming that level of uh, connection to other human beings. Thank I mean, you. that's enormous. Uh, anyway, you don't need to read my book. You get me. I get you. I get you. I can't even, I truly can't even imagine how, I mean, I have a little idea of how hard that would be. Um, I am, I love to hear as, as a fellow writer that um, writing saved your life. Mm. And I, I think all the people here who are writers do completely understand the, and how, how cathartic writing can be. And oftentimes even just getting something on the page that you didn't even know you felt, but suddenly exactly. you can see it. And if you're able to share your writing with someone else who can say, oh yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah. All of those are such connecting points. And I'm very happy for you that you've found that because you also mentioned that you had your own un undiagnosed mental issues, mm -hmm. correct? For quite and a while. For quite a while, yeah. And then it was diagnosed and it was like a, finally, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And it all made sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that happens to so many people. I'm a, I'm a, uh, a licensed professional counselor and I am very aware of, you know, there's always that, oh no, what if I learned? So it's like, thank you, God, I learned something. I learned yeah. So I know what to do now, or at least I can, I, I'm not crazy. I can figure out what's going on here. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, wow. Well, what wonderful motivations. And I'm, we're going to say here is Story Circle Network. You are getting the respect that you deserve. That book. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. You are welcome. And Sally, let's on a completely different note here. Let's hear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my entire life, I think I always had as a goal to write one book. I didn't know what it was going to be about. I was always working way too hard to find time to write. And when I when I left work early, because when I say early, I was 58. I think I'd always expected to work longer. But when my husband died, I said, you know what? No more briefcases, no more suits, no more heels, no more pantyhose. <laughs> if I have to, I will happily walk dogs. Walking dogs would be therapeutic and wonderful, and I wouldn't have to have a briefcase and write budgets or whatever. So I wanted to write a book, but I didn't really know what that was. And when I started writing mine, it was really much more of a journal. Um, and some of it was just cathartic. Some of it was just because I was in such deep grief that I had to write about something and including the good things, um, but mostly the sad things. And little by little, I just wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to let that be the end of my life. I was going to do more and, and I didn't know how it would turn out. And honestly, what it was originally about was how to have a very rewarding life that doesn't necessarily end the way you thought your life would end, that was going to be about volunteer work. It was going to be about rescuing dogs. I had been a Spanish professor in my 20s, so going to Central and South America gave me the chance to use my Spanish, to work with doctors who were training local doctors there, and do these amazing things that the people in the villages were never going to do. So that was going to be my memoir. But mm -hmm. then the ending became very different. And I really had to work to make sure that it wasn't 
you know, that it, that it wasn't like a fairy tale or a romance or anything, that it was seriously focused on what makes a meaningful life, including the humor, uh, because there is a lot of humor in, in life and there's, there's, <laughs> there's crap and there's pain. Um, but I think there's something very sacred about books. I think everybody here, when you hold up your book, and I forgot to put my awards, my little gold things on this, um, you look at it and you say, oh my gosh, that was five years of my writing, not always concerted and hard, but toward the end, it was really hours and hours and revising and revising and making sure it said what I wanted it to say. And I was motivated to do that. I And I didn't really care if it sold. I mean, of course, I'd like it to sell, sure. but it was, I can do this. And um, that was what was motivating to me. I had a, um, a motto, a, a blurb from Winston Churchill that said, never, never, never give up. And of course, he was saying that about World War II. Now, <laughs> I, if he didn't give up, I don't have to give up. Right. So that was my motivation, to write a book, to have it be about a meaningful life, however that ended up, and to not give up. Mm -hmm. um, well, and it sounds like that what you did is that you created a, a meaningful life. You you made conscious choices to build in a build a world where there was going to be a lot of uh, you were going to give you were going out in the world to give and you're creating a lot of meaning through but that. There were a lot of friends and there were also down times. I mean, I would you know like have a down week or two and kind of that inner voice saying, "Come on, come on, come on, go back, go back." go back to the, and win this. Um, but I did have friends and I had dogs. <laughs> and, you know, I, I walked a service dog for 12 years for a quadriplegic. I mean, how can I feel bad? And he, during the time I was with him, he lost the ability to speak and to eat. And he ultimately was just using one or two fingers on each hand. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And he didn't give up. Yeah. So what a wonderful message for your book, for anyone who's going through pain. And we all go through pain and, in you know, throughout our lives. Um, yeah, I, I can see how. And I, I, but I am impressed with the idea that you took some real risk. You did some things that really were out of the ordinary of what someone normally would say. Yeah, a woman, you know, you're, I don't know, you said your husband died when he was 57 or you no, were. I, I was 57. You were 57. Yeah. I see. I see. And so, but you took some big risks there, which is also part of the story, but, but also dogs make a big difference. <laughs> So to go you never want to minimize dogs. Girlfriends make a huge difference. And girlfriends make, make a, huge a huge difference. difference. And then these stories that my, that sound hilariously funny about these this internet um, dating or at least communication. I'm not sure there was dating occurring, but it certainly there was. Some. There was so much coffee. I was sick of coffee. Okay, well there we go. There's even more. Well, very good, very good. Thank uh, you. Well, that's that's an inspiring book on many levels. I mean, it's a funny book, but it's also an inspiring book. And for so many people uh, who are facing huge loss of a child or a parent or a spouse uh, or anyone who is especially meaningful to them, that alone is it's it's a sounds like it's a go to book for them for sure. And many other people just for some. Um, Thank you some motivation to live a meaningful life, to live a meaningful life. Uh, good for you, Sally. Um, all right, now we're going to question two. Let's see. Uh, this is for Kim and for Anastasia. And this is, please describe your writing process. And Kim, do you wanna go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, my writing process is, is heavily involved with free writing. 
So I like to sort of play with a journal or sometimes I type it out, but just kind of play with ideas and what if this happened or that happened and kind of work with that. And that's sort of where I build um, my stories from or writing from is that time kind of like um, Julia Cameron, you know, with your, with your three pages, I start with that, but then that grows a lot into um, actual pieces. I also use that a lot when I'm working, when I've, finally discovered a story, I use that as a way to prime the pump when I sit down to write, is that I use that free time and that free writing to kind of get rid of the clutter that's in my mind or to sort of um, zero in on what I'm doing at the time. And I also use it, use free writing a lot to ask myself questions. So like when I was writing Course Kitchen, I imagined that she and I were sitting down and having coffee. And so I was sort of writing out, you know, writing what she was responding to, you know, when the questions or whatever. So that's part of my process um, is actually spending time, just no rules, no just writing in notebooks or also in, um, it's funny, I sometimes use two different, and I sometimes I ask myself why I do this. If I'm on my Word document, I'm doing serious writing. Like I'm, I've got to get something done, but I'll play on pages with Apple. So like for some reason in my mind that tells me, okay, this doesn't have to go anywhere. And somehow I'm able to, to get things flowing a little bit better um, in that route. So most of my process has a lot about, I call it organic because I go back and forth between that free writing and structure. And then I take what I writ what I wrote in free writing and clean it up or expand on it and see where, where it holds or how, or I'll say, oh, this is great. I can build on this or, you know, or pull whole um, pieces out. Uh, it also helps that I spent several years or decades uh, being a writing teacher. I taught composition uh, college. And so thinking about the research and writing about the research and using the free writing to sort of explore what I found in research. It's just very organic and piecemeal, almost like building up a writing quilt, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when, and did you find Cora in that writing process or did you? I did. I did kind you? of had an, I had an idea that I, you know, I, I was going to grad school. I was going to go, I had, um, I'd already had one master's degree, but I went back to get an MFA and I wanted to write a story set in the 1920s because I loved that time period. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of was playing with that idea of who is this person that I want to write about. And so she did come up in those journals or those that journaling or that free writing um, mm -hmm. time. And, you know, of course there's iterations, although it's funny, um, we moved a couple of years ago and I pulled up something that I wrote free writing before I went to grad school. And I'm like, wow, you stuck a little bit, you stuck a lot closer to what you thought then, you know, a lot of times when you think, um, I think Anastasia was saying it, it's what you start with and what you end up with, mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised that it was a lot closer than I had anticipated that it would be. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like, I love that idea of switching from word to pages and that you gave yourself permission on pages to play. And I mean, and also the idea that you just let the play, you just went with that and kind of went deeper with it because then that adds so much dimension to your writing when you're not when you're not you know shoulders up and worried and nervous you just play it it's like well let's mm -hmm. see what could happen what would she do how I assume those are the questions you're asking yourself absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well do you think you'll continue with that writing process for another book Actually, I'm in the middle of doing that now. <laughs> I'm in the, okay, I'm, it's, so. it's very, it's very, very much in the, uh, I call it the discovery um, uh, phase where you're mm -hmm. just, I'm just, I'm in my pages document and I'm just, you know, writing, 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 trying to figure out where it's going. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. it definitely and then is. You're, and you're throwing, uh, you're including your uh, research so she met, uh, if you're writing about Langston Hughes or any of the other Harlem, Harlem Renaissance folks, then that would be find themselves, find its way into those pages, I'm guessing. Is right. I used, 
basically what I might say, oh, wait, what happened in this time period? So then I have to go do a little bit of research mm -hmm. or, and look into things oh, okay. and then bring that back mm -hmm. and sort of see how I can fold it, fold mm -hmm. it in there. Mm -hmm. That's where that organic, that's the organic process right there. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. We're going to, I'm going to learn from that, right? I've already <laughs> learned from that just <laughs> right now. So thank you. Anastasia, you want to tell us about your writing process? Sure. Um, it's, it's interesting. I always love listening to other people and listening to Kim talk about her process. Um, it is, it, it kind of, mine is not dissimilar in the sense that, you know, how they always have this definition of a plotter versus a pantser. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who sits down and has an outline and they write the whole story out and um, they know where it's going to go. I am not that person. I am a pantser. Yeah. Um, and what I try to do, like when I wrote Blurred Fates, um, the first draft, just as a little bit of an aside for writers out there, the first draft took me about nine months, but it took me about 10 years to get it published. Just to give you like a little bit of a, it lived in a drawer for three years. It's It wasn't like a linear process. Um, but I basically had some themes I wanted to explore. I knew the characters, the basic characters that were going to be in the book. And then I put them in a situation and added conflict mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. kind of wanted to see. So I knew the basic brush strokes of my characters, but I didn't know them totally until I saw them interacting with each other and interacting mm -hmm. with their world. And, um, by the end of the book, I felt like I could, I, I, they felt like real people to me. Like I would, would have been able to pick them out as they walked towards me on the street. But at the beginning, they were still somewhat nebulous. Um, but one of the things that a, a writing coach shared with me is that for people like us who think that we don't plot, a lot of times, and I heard Kim say that she was a writing teacher, that um, it, it, a lot of times it's in, it's, or it's in your head. So right. you kind of know where a plot needs to go. You know where there needs to be rising action. You know when the rhythm is falling off and you know how to add. And I think that that's sort of, if you, I feel like partially because I'm an older writer and I've read a lot that some of that, even though I'm not necessarily writing it down on paper, it's sort of in my head. Like right. as I'm writing, I'll be thinking, there needs to be something needs to happen here. Or that last chapter was so filled with anxiety kind of producing um, emotions that maybe this chapter, I need to bring it down a little bit, oh, give yeah. the reader some space. Yeah. So I think that sometimes those organic, the organic is, is yes, it's organic in our, in our way of operating, but there is structure already in us, if that makes right. any sense. Right. You intuitively know because yeah. of the reading you've done <laughs> and yeah. all the writing that you've also done. And you know, I mean, building in tension is critical. You must have tension if you want to keep people turning pages. And so it is, uh, it, it's helpful. I guess uh, my one question to you about your characters is, um, did well, you said that you had a basic idea of who these characters would be? What, and how did you... What did can you tell us a little more about that? So the uh, this goes into a little bit about the why I wrote this book. Um, I realized that there was a period of time in my life when what was going on inside my life was filled with a lot of chaos. My mother had been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. My stepdaughter came to live with us under duress. And while she lived with us, her mother died of a heroin overdose. And all of these things were kind of happening all at once. And the, the perspective I was giving the, the outside world was that my life was fine. Um, people would say, how are you? I'd be like, good, how are you? Okay. And, it, I, and, and I started to think about the fact that there are so many people out there that are, have that, that kind of disconnect between their internal reality and the external reality. And so I started thinking about what it would be like if there was a woman who was living this seemingly perfect life but there was a whole lot of information about her childhood and trauma that she experienced that she had not shared with anyone, mm -hmm. even in some ways herself. Um, and what would happen if that was triggered and she could not tell people why she was behaving the way she was because she would have to reveal that wow. trauma to be able to oh, say wow. that, to oh, share that. Wow. But okay. if she didn't share it, she was being destroyed from the inside out. So 
there's that's this, the core conflict of that's mom. the core conflict is that she's that trapped by I yes. say she's trapped by the unspoken and I think there's a lot of people out there in the world that can relate to that they may not understand her exact circumstances right. but they can relate to that feeling of of not being able to be tr true to oneself and that oh, that can, can of course. cause you to behave in ways that don't even make sense sometimes to, you know, you don't even know why you're doing something, right. but I, my hope you, was got a whole series of secrets that. Yeah. Want yeah. To reveal. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of where, so that's, but as a result, my characters became known to me as they became known to themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, see, that's the whole point is that a, it's a discovery process, isn't it? And that's what both of you are saying is that you're just opening yourself up to discovery of all the people, all the circumstances that you know about in your many, you know, years of being alive. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that sometimes those, it's not just the experiences you've had, but, you know, the experiences of family members, of friends, yes. of community members, and mm -hmm. And I also found myself doing research as I wrote because something would come up in one of my characters' life and I'd realize I need to know more about this. And mm -hmm. so then I would do the research and a lot of times I would be surprised that that would also give me interesting plot twists or things that I had not thought about. Um, so it was, it was a really fun process for me. Okay, all yeah. right. Well, those that I, that's very, very helpful in terms of just opening did you say goodbye? Oh, okay. A question uh, Liz is pointing out to me. Uh, one question was, did you have to, did you say goodbye to your characters, Anastasia? And Kim, did you say goodbye to your characters? Or you really will, say first? will we <laughs> see them again? Um, I doubt you will see my characters again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. I think once you get, once I was done with them, I just felt done with them. It okay. just, it felt, it felt close to me. It felt complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mine was not at the end. The ending is a little open-ended, but I don't intend at this point to write more about them, but I did. Um, I tend to write what I call hopefully ever after endings instead of happily ever after mm -hmm. um, my characters. There's, there's movement towards something, but it's not necessarily like a, a, a total resolution in their lives. I see. So, I didn't say goodbye to them. They're still out there somewhere. I know they are. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you draw them that clearly in your own mind and on the on the, on the page, they are out there. They they are alive. Um. Okay. Thank you guys very much. Um. Third question. This is for Valina and Margaret. What are some surprises that came with writing your book? Valina, do you want to start? Sure. And I think this fits right into our discussion and uh, what Story Circle really tries to promote, um, which is nurturing authors to learn how to share their own stories. Uh, and my book is nonfiction. I mean, it's the focus of it is women, queer people who have been wrongfully convicted. Uh, and, and I do have like a central story for that with some central folks all the way through. Um, but I was surprised how much people pushed me to put my own story in there. And then once mm -hmm. I did, uh, how much people really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a prosecutor before I became a, a wrongful convictions litigator. And I'm also a queer woman. Uh, in fact, my wife is on the call watching. So hello, hello, <laughs> Valina's <laughs> wife. <laughs> so I'm um, putting those things in there. Uh, it really mattered to me in my process uh, more than I thought it would. And it ended up mattering to a number of readers as well. Um, so even if you're thinking about writing um, nonfiction, uh, maybe think about some way to, to put yourself in there. Uh, and then the other thing that surprised me was, I I, I know this is a, a pervasive issue of wrongful convictions of people based on gender and sexual orientation, uh, but I didn't expect to be getting letters from people saying, here's how this has happened to me, um, here was my experience. Uh, so that's been really, uh, really pretty powerful. Oh, I bet, I bet, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I think it's wonderful that you included your own story in the book because I I think that that would be an integral part of your book. And that's probably exactly what the people who were reading your book said to you <laughs> at the time, because this was also your own growth. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, that you went from a prosecutor to this litigator. I mean, you went from one side to the other there. Of, I, so, I mean, you've, you've, you have, um, made some very clear choices about how you wanted to to spend your life is what I'm hearing there. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. And had key things happen along the way, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but to move from being you know, someone who prosecuted uh, sexual violence, frankly, mm -hmm. to, you know, Lee and Tammy's case where they're charged with um, yeah. sexual violence. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I'm glad I was able to share that story and how I came to where I am now as well. I, and I'm also a teacher. And so I, I um, to, to get myself into it, because sometimes people say, oh my gosh, how can you put yourself into a book that's so vulnerable? And it is. But and to get is. myself into that, I thought about, well, what would help my students if they were reading, uh, reading this book? Um, and I... To myself, I thought, well, having a story where someone can make mistakes uh, and grow and change and you learn as you go. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was kind of the lens I used to put my own story in there. Oh, very good. Very good. Yeah. Being vulnerable, being open, being willing to show your foibles along the way. I think we all appreciate that. Thank you for that, Alina. Uh, and we have a question from Sean. She said, it may be too personal, but wondering what brought you to Indiana. Is there a case that stays with you? Oh, those are two questions. And is there a case that stays with you more than some of the others? So I am from Indiana. <laughs> so I'm actually very happy to be back in Indiana. I've been gone for a long time, but happy to be back. And I'm in Bloomington. And uh, my wife and I both got fabulous jobs here. So that's why we're back. Uh, and then a case that stays with you. Um, so I continue to represent people. And one person I'm representing right now, if anyone's interested in looking it up, is a woman named Tasha Shelby uh, in Mississippi. Uh, and she was wrongly convicted of a child death, her stepson's death. So similar to what I said about Christine Bunch at the beginning, you know, there are a number of women who are wrongly convicted. Uh, of child deaths. And, you know, Margaret would actually know a fair bit about this, probably like genetic disorders mm -hmm. that children can have that are sadly fatal. Um, but if you don't find that out or don't know that, mm -hmm. uh, then we can see these wrongful convictions. So that would be one case. Oh, wow. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, and how about you, Margaret? One of the bigger surprises was how long it took to write it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and then there were gaps in there that I just couldn't couldn't remember. I mean, there was a I, I, I had I had the first draft and there was a lot of stuff about one particular thing that we decided to shelve altogether it was about a third that got got shelved. And then I had to fill it up. And and I and I and then at one point, uh, my editor comes to me and says, "You've got this huge gap. You've got this huge gap about your residency. There is hardly anything about your residency." And I said, "I blocked it all." <laughs> and because it was it was it was it was it was uh, it was a hard time. I still would do it all over again because it was a great uh, a great center, a great training center. It's the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, one of the top hospitals in North America, if, if not in the world. So I would do it again, but it was really tough. And I had a really hard time. So that was a surprise because I didn't realize how much I had kind of put it away. And the other one was, as I was writing it, I realized that one particular patient that has, um, it sort of starts my journey into writing a story that I wrote about her in my very first creative writing course. And um, and I, I mentioned it at the very beginning. And then I realized as I was writing this that I cannot leave that story unfinished. And it was a patient with a very severe uh, 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 genetic condition that I met when the mother was 
still pregnant with her. And then she was born and she had a very difficult course. Uh, she spent the first entire life in, in the PICU, pediatric intensive care unit, finally went home. Um, and, and then she died because she had a brain hemorrhage and it was partly as a result of her condition. And and I realized that I cannot write my memoir. That was it was a surprise, but it, it when I realized it, it was a surprise, but it wasn't a surprise. I had to tell her story, but I couldn't without getting permission from the parents and her mother. And so it took me a good three years to sort of um, work on that relationship with the with the mother um, and through her th with the father. And uh, and and she was all all for it. From the moment I mentioned that I want to write the story about Savannah as part of my memoir, she said, oh, absolutely. Um, but um, I, because of what I was saying about Savannah and because of my thoughts about her, it, I had to explain to her that. And it took us a, a little bit of time. So it took us a long time to do that. But in the end, I have her permission. They they were at my book launches and everything. So so it, it ended up being wonderful. But so there were two surprises, how long it took and that I needed to sort of rebuild the relationship with the patient and patient's parents to make my story whole. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't, at the time, you didn't even realize that that was that it would be that important when I started yes. writing it. Yeah. And then you had that whole residency gap. Oh, yeah. That. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's your other surprise. Yeah, I'm forgetting I, it I now assume, again. I assume that you wrote about that. Yeah. 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 I had to go back to those terrible times. But yeah. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, oh, oh, hold on. Liz has got me here. Okay, number four. Now, this is for Kim and for Sally. Sally, let's start with you. What were some unexpected obstacles you faced? And you need to unmute, Sally. Unmute. I knew that in writing about the emotional times that it would be hard to bring them up. Unlike Margaret, I didn't forget them but refreshing them just brought it right back. Um, and that was really hard, but I knew it would be hard. Mm -hmm. I also didn't know how much rewriting I would have to do to make it. I mean, there were some things that I wrote to the point that I, I, I could barely stand it, like writing something a fifth time and thinking, but haven't I done this? But, but I think I knew at least halfway that I would have to do that. What I didn't know was the business end or the non-writing end. Um, I didn't know how awful it would feel to go get blurbs. Um, I, I didn't really think I have to have the blurbs before it goes to press. <laughs> Every chapter I have starts with the... Um, the title of a chapter is the title of a song that means a lot to me. And I love folk music. I love rock and roll. I love country rock. So I, oh no, no, no. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You can't, if I, if I try to get my, um, face back. I'm afraid I'll lose you all again. I'm having internet problems. So I'm just going to speak. No, we can see you. Oh, you can see we me. We can see your face and we can hear you. Okay. Well, I asked Willie Nelson to blurb me. <laughs> I asked Chris Christopherson to blurb me. They wrote me letters, nice let not they, but their managers or handlers saying, Sorry, we can't blurb you, but Lacey J. Dalton, who's one of my favorite singers, blurbed me. And but it was really hard to put my hat in my hand and go ask people to blurb me. Yeah. The other thing that I had no idea um, would be so hard was getting copyright authorizations. It was in the middle of COVID. Um, my last two years were COVID years. And nobody was in the office and some um, copyrights 
were in people's paper files and they couldn't go into their offices. So there I was rewriting some chapters so I could paraphrase mm. the, the copyright um, copyright uh, bl uh, phrase. Um, there was a quote from Montaigne and I thought, oh, well, good. It's over a hundred years. I can use this. But it was the translation that was under copyright, mm -hmm. not what he said in French, but the person mm -hmm. who translated it. So I retranslated it because I minored in French. The <laughs> worst copyright was something that permeated two or three chapters I had, and I couldn't I couldn't rewrite three chapters. It was a quote from a poet named Lydia Davis. Mm -hmm. My wonderful sleuth, a woman who was a consultant to me, her name is Barrett Brisky. She went after whoever she thought might have the copyright. It turned out that the United States and Australia had the copyright from one company. I mean, for, for, for one, for the quote, but the UK and South Africa was another publishing company. And truly, we had gone to press before I got approval for that wow. copyright. Wow. And it was scary. I mean, and the only reason we got it was that this wonderful consultant, Barrett, remembered somebody who had retired from, I don't remember if it was Random House or Penguin, and she had her email, and that person knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. So that was really, really something I had no plan to have to deal with. I, I think those are enough. The business side um, during COVID was really hard. Oh, wow. Good heavens. Sounds like <laughs> it was really hard. And I wouldn't it wouldn't <laughs> occur to me that that would ever be that difficult, even no. during COVID, because everybody's at their computer. But I can see where it got complicated. Well, uh, and I love things, Lydia Davis, by the way. So oh, I, you know. it was uh, head heart. It was the poem. And mm. I was operating from my head and operating from my heart. And I right. just love Lydia Davis. Mm -hmm. but, trying to get copyright authorizations when people aren't in their offices and things are in paper files. I wanted to break into their office and, and go into their files anyway. <laughs> you had to exercise some, uh, some determination, some calmness, some, uh, you had to do some meditation just on <laughs> this particular area. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Kim, what about you? Oh, go ahead and unmute Kim. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I was hearing some background noise at home. So I was, um, huh, my unexpected obstacles. So it's one of those things we used to teach in school about whether or not you want to share everything. But um, actually, I would have to say I had one obstacle that I was unexpected that, I, you know, really did kind of get into the writing and the revision of it is that in the you know, after I had written the first um, first couple of drafts of it, then I was going back through and um, working on another another draft. And in that time period, I lost my oldest son. And oh. I, you know, it, just the the how even couple, even years after that, because it took me a couple of years to be able to to go back to that. And someone had said to me at a writing retreat because I was having such a hard time um, getting through the revision. And she, I, I met with a woman who had also lost a child and who had explained to me that in my mind, that part of the reason why I couldn't finish this draft was that it was about closure and that I would never have closure as far as my kid was concerned. And that just opened, like when I left that writing retreat after she told me, said that to me, because she had walked that similar journey as I did, I was able to sit down and go back and and actually finish that draft. But I mean, clearly, I was not um, not something that I had planned or you know or anything like that. But I think if I if I think of all of the obstacles of that, is kind of still seeing the book through and rewriting it after you know such a devastating thing. Oh yeah, well, and what a what a what a terrible loss. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I am a crier and I just immediately <laughs> go to that. Don't. So sorry, but uh, that's just, yeah. Um, but how wonderful you found that fate brought you together with this person who understood your journey. Wow. I felt and you know what? I think it was important because I was, you know, when I was thinking about it and you asked that question, I thought, do I want to say that or do I want to pick something else? Um, I think all of us would probably um, testify that, you know, the trauma in our lives or things that happen in our lives, it does, you know, it's it's probably what what motivates most of us to write in some in some ways. And it's so easy to cover it up or to not share. But I, you know, I, I just feel like with my particular journey, that 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 shaped me in terms of of even how I wrote it or how you know you know how I reapproached it, but it, it definitely you know the survivorness in it you know to yeah. just keep forging ahead is was very powerful. So yeah, yeah, and 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 just as Sally was saying with her loss, that whole thing of moving forward, even when you I'm sure you don't want to at all. But the whole thing about the closure, very astute observation on the part of your fellow writer there at that workshop. Uh, and I'm so happy that, that that was able to open you up so that you could continue. That yeah, was, it was, it, it was the worst. I mean, aside from that, it was actually the worst writing retreat I ever went to. But, um, <laughs> well, there you go. You had one reason to be but, there and it was But I, was, I do believe that... Was that I do. It was horrible. But anyway, the the I do believe that I was there as a, a what they call a divine appointment to meet with this woman who exactly. she and I were able to connect and she played a big part in that journey. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. And that's very validating for all of us when we're dealing with, you know, these enormous things that happen in our lives that there are things greater than ourselves that come and in, come into play in this self absolutely like absolutely yeah. and that supports you in ways that you didn't even um expect because i mean it was just a i mean she was just like a blessing she she was a blessing like out of nowhere yeah. you know mm -hmm. wonderful well thank you for taking the risk to share that with us oh, i appreciate you're welcome. that um okay now the next question is for anastasia and for valina and it is advice to our viewers on what you know on, on what you know that could help them when writing or publishing their books. This is next to the last question, by the way. So go ahead, Valina, why don't you go first? And I let me repeat that. Advice to our viewers on what you know now that could help them with writing or publishing their books. Sure. So um what uh, ended up being really helpful to me and that again uh, Story Circle Network helps with is uh, finding some writing partners. Uh, so just having someone who's on the same page as you in terms of supporting you, supporting your writing. Uh, and I, what really helped me was having a regular schedule that each week there were two friends I had who were writers who were also working on projects and we would meet up over Zoom say hi, turn off our screens, and just write for an hour. And then at the end of it, we check in, how'd it go? Oh, it's horrible. But we did it. And that's mm -hmm. really what helped me actually uh, get through the book and make progress on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing uh, I learned was it, it, don't give up. You know, like Sally was saying about talking to different people about uh, getting blurbs. I mean, trying to get a publisher, trying to get an agent. Uh, I know someone in the Q and A and the questions asked about agents. I did end up getting an agent, but wow! I mean, just reaching out again and again and again and again. Um, and right now, I'm working on, which I'm very excited about, but a Chinese translation of my book. Oh wow. my gosh! Wow. And that is. Yeah, I'm so excited. That's only because of reaching out to people who uh, I admire, um, reaching out to, you know, someone I maybe know through someone else, uh, and trying to piece things together. So there's a lot of effort on that end of it, definitely. 
Wonderful. Yeah, I would say this is a process of <laughs> the death of the ego here. You just have to kind of go, all right, I'm just going to put myself out there. I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to try and it'll be okay no matter what, even if they reject me, even if Willie Nelson. <laughs> but uh, no, that's very helpful. Thank you, Valina. How could and Willie that, Nelson reject me? Well, he's he's pretty busy. Maybe that's it. But you did get that woman you were pleased with. And I love your musical choices. They're all my favorites too. So, okay, Anastasia, what about you? So ask um, your viewers on what you have learned from writing or publishing your book. I would say, the, well, uh, many of the things that people have already said, you know, finding um, people to, to help support you along the way, um, recognizing the things that you can do yourself and the things that you need other people to do for you. Um, I am a copy, a trained copy editor, but I realized pretty um, like halfway through the, the copy editing process, I couldn't copy edit my own work. Um, I needed to hire someone to do it. Um, so there's times when you like just have to admit this is not, I have to turn it over to someone else, someone with more expertise or someone with fresh eyes. That's also a really important thing is to have people with fresh eyes look at your work. Um, I would say that the biggest piece of advice I have is try to learn as much as you can about the business side of publishing and about the business side of book production. That was something that I did not know a lot about. So I found myself often um, not surprised, but uh, just caught off guard by the next step. Like I didn't know about the different pages of design when your book is being designed and how you have to like edit it multiple times for different things. And, um, and also just the learning the difference between PR and marketing and sales and how those impact, you know, what you have to do at each stage. I did not know, for example, that much of the book market or the PR happens before the book is published, mm. um, that the six months prior to your book is when you have your PR, you know, push to get people to know that you exist and that your book exists and things like that. There was a lot of those um, on the ground lessons that I that I learned that if you can find a book or if you can find a resource in through the network or um, or through your local writing community, um, anything or even just somebody reach out to one of us and say like, can you help? Uh, I, I always love getting on a Zoom with one other person and just sort of literally downloading all the things that I learned <laughs> that might be helpful to them. Um, and if somebody had spent an hour with me, it would have been so valuable. So I'm, if anybody's out there, I know this is kind of a crazy thing to say, but if you're out there and you just want someone to sort of say, these are some of the steps that are going to happen in your life, in the life of a book. Um, I think that those can be really helpful, um, those kinds of conversations. So that's the advice I would give. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I think that that oftentimes is the business end is the part. Everybody's a writer here and they're not the business people to create the book or market the book or any of that. And I think that's oftentimes one of those places where everybody gets overwhelmed because they yeah. it's brand new information. Uh, you're kind of a you're a total novice getting at, putting your toe in the water there and it can be can be a lot. Yeah. And, and fellow writers, I mean, people have helped me along the way. So I love being able to, to kind of pay that, pay that back or pay it forward um, to other writers. So, and I think that many of us in the community feel that way. Like we just are so grateful to the people who have helped us um, mm -hmm. that we love being able to help others. So, well, reach out. That's my thank advice. You. Reach out. Thank you. And let me also offer as the uh, online classes coordinator for Story Circle Network, please consider uh uh, and I know Kim has done this in the past, consider uh, offering a class with us. Oh, because I would love to. I would love to, to do just, yeah, like just a, here's the Yeah, the no, I mean, because we're always looking for classes and particularly that would be an especially helpful one. And you can just go to our website, storycircle.org and go to the online classes. There was a propo proposal form at the bottom of those. And then it'll, it'll help you walk through the process or you can write me. And uh, you have my email and uh, I'll help you with that process as well. Okay. okay. Awesome. Okay. Now we're on the uh, final question. 
uh, how did you feel when you found out that your book won the Sartan or the Gilda Award? So everybody has an opportunity to tell us that story. So uh, who would like to go first? I'll go first. Okay, Kim, go ahead. I was <laughs> I was driving when you called, I think, and it, it just was so thrilling. Like it was hard to drive and, and beat my steering wheel. <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, when I saw the call come up on my phone, most of the time I don't answer, you know, uh, calls that I don't recognize but something told me to answer it and that it's just I was so thrilled it was such a breath of um, of fresh air and excitement it was just like a booster shot to me oh, it was good. great it was good. so fun it's a, certainly a validation yeah for absolutely all pushing through to get to the end of that story and getting it on the getting it out into the world who else would like to share Sally go ahead uh, unmute unmute there you go like like kim um i was thrilled like kim i don't usually answer phone calls that i don't recognize the number it was a woman from texas and i'm from louisiana so i recognize this accent even though i don't have it um i was stunned I mean, I think my biggest thing was surprise. I was thrilled. That was my second feeling, but I was stunned. Um, I was humbled. I, I started crying. I, I, I just felt, it's not that I didn't think I was worthy, but I was humbled. And I haven't figured that one out. I felt very validated. I felt like the Christmas Eve and the New Year's Eve I spent working till midnight and one o'clock were worth it. Uh, I wasn't always sure they were worth it, but I did feel validated, but I felt very humbled. And a girlfriend and this person that came in as a result of Pastrami, whose name I will not mention, um, they were there. And my girlfriend, Susan, was actually videoing me and I kept saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I was teary. That's how I felt. Ah, I love that visual of you have somebody video tell you you're just, no, that's wonderful. And yeah, I can, because you said, Sally, that you were writing your book for you mainly. You didn't really know if you would, you know, it'd be nice if people would read it, but you weren't writing it for that reason. So that was that was even more validating for you to to have that response. Good lesson there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anastasia, you want to go next? Sure. Um, very similar experience. I was did not recognize the phone number, thought, oh, and normally wouldn't pick it up, picked it up and just. I, I found myself that's just like this, this, all these emotions kind of coming at me really quickly. Um, surprised, definitely um, thrilled. And, and it, it felt, as you said, validation was a word that came up in my head um, and just honored, like just mm -hmm. so honored and um, excited and uh surprise I I think that it also was um when I spoke with I think it was with Liz and she said you can't tell anyone yet um <laughs> and I was like oh this is like oh my gosh that's like gonna be the hardest thing in the world because all I wanted to do was just tell everyone um but that was just it was just a even just now I feel those same rush of emotions just thinking about it and mm -hmm. um really just so honored and delighted. Oh, wonderful. I Wonderful. Um, Valina, you want to go? Sure. Um, so I responded to it on kind of a different level. I mean, everything that everyone else was saying, but um, both when I found out I was a finalist and then when I, I finally um, won the Sartan Nonfiction Award, um, May Sartan 
was a lesbian. Uh, she didn't write so much about that identity, but did about her identity as a woman. And it felt in this year, you know, being a queer person writing about um, queer women being wrongly convicted, so important, um, just with hate crimes on the rise against queer people. It just felt really, really, really important that this certain nonfiction award, you know, recognize we need to support all women. Yes. Uh, and and that my book had won just struck a really um, powerful note for me. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Well, and that is our mission. Yeah. For all women to tell their stories. And, um, and you know, the uh, it is an important time. It's an important time to tell that story and to get the, that out, out there in the world. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. And taking the risk to do it and be vulnerable yourself. So thank you. And Margaret? So um, we have a landline at home and I never give out the landline number. And, uh, but for some reason at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon, uh, the phone rang on the landline. Nobody calls you at 5.30 Eastern Standard Time, you know, on a Friday. And, and I never pick up the landline because it's either telemarketers, duct cleaning services or scams. Mm -hmm. So I was literally sitting right next to the landline phone when it rang. And I, I as, a, as, a, as a rule, I don't answer it. My husband upstairs picked it up. I said, "Oh no, he's gonna get, he's gonna give money to charity again. He's gonna get <laughs> scammed again or something." And then he calls me from downstairs. It's somebody calling from Texas about your book. And I go, "What?" It was a total surprise. It was such a total <laughs> surprise. I started going, "Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you." And then the person said something else to me, and I was still on the "thank you, thank you, thank you" loop. And I didn't answer her question. I just kept going. Thank you. It was it was such a thrill. It was such a surprise. It was just wonderful. But thankfully, thankfully, my husband picked up the landline. Yeah, your husband somehow knew. Saved the day. That, that, that's right. We have a lot of that today. There, everybody, nobody usually picks up those on those calls. And I don't. And even... then, and then I was. I did something really bad. I did something really, really bad because I was also told not to tell anybody. So of course, I told my husband because he picked up the phone. But though, then I, I had to call my publisher. Yes. And I couldn't get a hold of her. And the only way I could get a hold of her was through Facebook, phoning, FaceTime and whatever. And I got her husband because she was already out of the office, right? Because it was 5.30 on the, you know, Eastern Standard Time in the afternoon on a Friday. So I called her on the Facebook and she goes, what, what's it? And I go, I have to tell you, but you're not, you're not supposed to tell anybody. So that's my story. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I love the fact that you guys phone people. I think that is so amazing. It's, it yeah. makes so yeah. special. And I love that. I just totally love it. Oh, good. Good. Liz, you want to come back on? Oh. I have to say that I, I so I told my oh. husband, I have to, I have to admit, I told my husband, but my husband is the worst secret keeper. And I don't think he'll mind me saying this, but so we were, we were visiting with my sister over the weekend and my, um, at some point my, my husband's looking at me and he's got this like smile on his face. And I'm like, what what's going on and he's like oh, I, just, I just can't do this I can't do it and I said what and he goes and he turns to my sister and he goes she won an award I can't tell you which one it is and I can't tell you anything else about it but I just had to tell somebody I'm like bursting inside I'm like that's the funniest thing ever but he was just like he was more excited than you were about know, he had this look on his face somebody. like I can't do it I can't do it so it's really funny um, I'd like to tell one thing about the phone call that I got. I also was stunned that it was a phone call instead of an email or some impersonal something. But the lovely woman from Texas who maybe talked to others, she told me I had won the Gilda. I said, I don't know what the Gilda is. She said, well, it, you know, you submitted it to the memoir genre, but the person in charge of that 
called the me because I'm in charge of the Gilda genre, the category. And you probably wouldn't have won the other one, but you won this one. And we knew right away. You, and I'm like, but I didn't even apply for that. So that was fabulous. <laughs> well, I know who that was, too. And, and <laughs> well, I need to thank that person. Yes, exactly. That was great. That was that was a good call on their part, for sure. Uh, now, Liz has got something for me to read over here. Uh, in the interest of time, we will end here, she says. We will be, okay, this will be replayed. Okay, let me, I have to look at all this. All right, uh, you'll find me. Okay, I have to read it because I have no idea what she's telling me to say here. Okay, this will be replayed at our at our virtual conference, which is in October, and we hope everybody will come. Uh and you will find interviews with everybody here in our current and future journals. So yes, that's coming up. Uh, join our mailing list at storycircle.org uh, to find out about other upcoming events and opportunities through Story Circle Network. And on behalf of Story Circle Network, <laughs> I'm glad I'm reading all of this. We want to congratulate you again. Uh, <laughs> as Liz would say, thank you and good night. <laughs> you can see Liz is no nonsense over here. Anyway, I want to thank you personally for being so open and uh, it just makes your stories very human. It helps all of us who are writing books or writing anything to hear your struggles, to hear how you've made it through hard times and it's and you've done very very well and congratulations on receiving the Sarton and the Gilda Award for you, Sally. Thank and you all now, so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. You're welcome. You're thank welcome. Thank you.